This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at reactroundup.com slash kendo UI. Hey folks, we are live at Microsoft Build. And I am here with Matt Hernandez and Amanda Silver. Um, Amanda, you've been on the show before. Do you want to just introduce yourself really quickly? Sure, yeah. I'm the Director of Program Management at Microsoft, working on Visual Studio and VS Code. Awesome. And Matt, what do you do? So I'm, uh, I'm a mix between the Azure and the VS Code team. I, uh, I lead the effort to build the Azure extensions in VS Code, trying to bring uh, Node developers, JavaScript developers, to Azure through uh, some great experiences in VS Code. That makes a lot of sense. So um, let's talk about Visual Studio Code first, and then I kind of want to dive into the Azure part of things, because I don't think we've talked about that on the show yet. So. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a new effort. Yeah. So what's new in Visual Studio Code? You want to talk about some of your, your favorite stuff? Uh, sure. So uh, big stuff that I'm excited about will be the log points pieces, as well as not to like get into the Azure extensions already, but uh, remote debugging is something that we just landed as well. Uh, that along with functions, Azure functions pieces and stuff like that, building the uh, local experience for that. Mm -hmm. Those are the things I'm really excited about. Uh, as far as VS Code Core, uh, I'm mostly an extension developer. Right. So a lot of the pieces that I'm excited about are really focused on the, the new APIs for extension developers, mm -hmm. uh, the new view containers. So you can add your own icon on the left-hand side, that kind of thing. Awesome. Yeah, I guess for me, the thing I'm most excited about for VS Code is is Visual is Live Share. Yeah. Which basically allows uh, two developers to collaborate simultaneously, so they can mm -hmm. kind of see each other's uh, cursors at the same time. Yeah. They can share a debug session and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's we, cool. I think we talked a bit about that at Connect. Yeah. And yeah. such a cool feature. It is, and it's getting even better. Yeah. We've added like uh, support for shared servers so mm -hmm. that you can actually see the browser uh, oh, from wow. the other person's machine uh, through a secure channel. So you're basically running uh -huh. it on localhost, but you can actually directly see it on, you know, let's say you're the guest for mm -hmm. the session. You can see it as well. So that's, that's new awesome. since Connect. And then the other thing is, uh, is shared terminal. Uh huh. Um, so basically, we could have a terminal sharing session, so that I can get. Let's say you're the host and I'm the guest. Uh -huh. I can actually get a terminal that is has complete access, depending on what you access right. you give to me, um, to your machine, just like any other terminal. So that makes it super easy. Like if you have yep. a uh, a dev configuration problem, or like you have a Git uh -huh. problem for your your particular clone, like. It makes it easy to work through those kinds of issues. And the other thing that's new, new since Connect is we now have Linux support. So if you're a Linux developer using VS Code, you can still use Live Share. Oh, that's to nice. Do it. Yeah. Yeah, I've done some development, you know, paired uh, across the internet, yeah, to somebody that's on Linux. And it was just kind of a, okay, well, let me see if there's a way I can set up some way for you to connect to my machine. And then you use Tmux or something. Right, and right. Yeah, yeah, this is a lot easier. Here's a link. Click it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's really cool. And uh, yeah. So I, I believe at Connect, the live sharing was kind of an invite only deal. Right. And so that's one thing that we announced yesterday is it's now public to the world. So anybody can share with anybody and it's free. Nice. Yeah. Is it going to stay free? It's going to stay free. Um, I think, you know, the... We think that there's a set of requests that enterprises have right. for auditing mm -hmm. and ACLs and things like that, that we, right. we can have a more premium version of it uh, with. Mm -hmm. But but the version that's available right now is mm -hmm. free and will remain free. Right. And for the uninitiated, ACLs are access control something? Yes. Access control. <laughs> what is it? Access control. <laughs> no, first time I've heard this. <laughs> uh, levels. Access okay. control levels. Yeah. Nice. Makes sense. Okay. That, yeah, it's really exciting. I remember seeing the demos and just going, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, the shared terminal was next level. That was 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the first time I've actually seen that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, now I just need to get VS Code on all of my servers so I can just... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes it really awesome. I mean, at awesome. this point, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, one, one scenario that we've heard people talk about you, using it for is, like, let's say you have a CI server uh -huh. that, that hosts your builds, right? And you want to go configure something, but, like, it's it's in the cloud. It might not be anywhere near your office. Yep. You know, this lets you have a hosting session there that that you can connect to it. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me when I was a uh, systems administrator long, long, long time ago. But yeah, we had, you know, basically a remote desktop into Windows servers. Right. And, you know, it, kind of at that level. Yeah, it is. So. But without all of the OS overhead yeah. for the GUI stack. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Is there, are there other things that are coming up in VS Code that... There's always things that are coming up in VS Code that are, that are really exciting. Some of, some of which, you know, we're we're still trying to figure out exactly how mm -hmm. to do it, and so it's stuff some stuff that we can't. Right. We're not even talking about publicly yet, but uh, but I mean, I think I think one of the things that really makes the VS Code product so loved mm -hmm. is that they're constantly responding to requests from the community, yep. and it's really like little things, like yep. you know. Icon support, oh, no. multi-line cursors, um, yeah. the multi-root file stuff. This is all stuff that we did a while ago, but 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 it's little things like um, you know, slightly better. Uh, like the markdown support has just gotten a lot better. You know, just a whole bunch of little things that you know would never make it to the mm -hmm. level of a keynote per right. se, but they add up. That and it's what makes the product so loved. Makes sense for me. Um, things got to the point with the extensions and all of the other things for some of the languages that I use on a regular basis, um, which JavaScript is always well supported, but the Ruby support has kind of come a long way. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, and so I, I generally work in Ruby and JavaScript when I'm working on my own projects. And, uh, yeah, I, I know there are going to be howls of pain across the universe, but I switched to VS Code. From cool. Emacs. Yeah. So. so one thing that you might be uh, interested to try out is that visual, the live share feature works for any language. So you could do live share Ruby. Oh, wow. Yeah. Including debugging. Nice. Yeah. I'll have to try that out. Yeah, try it out. Very cool. And we'll probably have to get some, one of you or somebody else on to uh, Ruby Rogues to talk about it because it sounds like it really sure. I mean, you know, we're not necessarily yeah. Ruby experts, but but um, yeah, but it's, it's a it, tool yeah. thing that everybody kind of yeah. would understand. I think yeah, sure, sure. All right, well, let's talk about Azure. So yeah. Azure's this cloud thing, and VS Code's this runs on my machine thing. So how does the extension work? So we have a we have a handful of different Azure services that we're that we're leveraging to uh, to try and get node developers and get their experiences really nicely, uh, really nice on Azure. The the core services that we're, we're targeting will be the app service. That's like uh -huh. our paths. Uh, that, now that we have Linux on there, it's all in uh, GA. Everything is ready to go. It's production mm -hmm. ready. Uh, you can do custom images, like custom Docker images on the Linux side as well on app service. And then from there, we're also targeting the the Azure Functions piece of the serverless, the serverless offering to do event-driven programming. Uh, Aside from that, we have a couple of other extensions that kind of play well into those services. So uh, storage, we have a storage mm -hmm. extension so you can do things like test your local Azure Functions serverless apps that are connected to your, your storage accounts. Uh, we have a Cosmos extension where you can set up like your MongoDB databases, mm -hmm. connect those to your apps that are running on the paths. Um, we have a Docker extension that helps walk you through the process of building those Docker images and deploying them. For, uh, for people who may not be super familiar with Docker. And those are the big ones. I feel like I'm missing something, and I definitely am, mm -hmm. but I can't come up with it now. Well, I mean, I think, I think you know, what you were talking about earlier in terms of, like, log points, for example, mm -hmm. like, is a generic debugging feature for the cloud, but really the, the reason that we're doing it is so that Azure developers have an easier time diagnosing their apps on Azure. Um, there's, did you talk about points? Cosmos DB extension yeah. and that kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, the Cosmos, the Cosmos extension is one of the more interesting ones because uh, we, we did some kind of experimental stuff with that. So you can open up what's called a scrapbook mm -hmm. and uh, connect it to a database either locally or running on Azure. Uh, it's targeting the, the Mongo API, but 
once you open the scrapbook, you have IntelliSense for like your Mongo queries, and then right. you can execute them directly in there. And you can save like the commands that you use the most, that kind of thing. Uh, you can kind of troubleshoot commands with the IntelliSense and build them up, and then mm -hmm. use them to to uh, put those queries into your applications, stuff like that. Uh, that one, I just released it. I actually released it while I was at the Node booth yesterday because I wanted to get it. I wanted to get it out before my talk last yep. night, and. Uh, we fixed a lot of bugs in that one. We had a we, we gave it a lot of love, and we uh, we kind of fixed that scrapbooking experience to make it a little more discoverable. Right. So, what are log points? You mentioned that a couple of times. Log points. Log points are um, kind of like dynamic console log statements. So, if you have a, so you have a node process that's, process that's running, uh, you may have state uh -huh. that's that's uh, causing an issue. Like, Something, something going on in your app that's causing an issue, and the state is very important. So rather than stopping it and then restarting it with the inspector in, in place and uh -huh. connecting the debugger, uh, you can put an inline log point and log out the state of an object or uh -huh. anything else, uh, and then you just re rehit that route from your browser or curl or whatever. Go ahead. No, please. <laughs> so essentially, uh, you can just put in a statement that's something like, it's sort of like console log. Yeah except it gives you a richer look at what the state of the app is. Right, and you can do this. So uh, it's available directly in VS Code for local uh -huh. local long points, but you can also do it. We have some experimental stuff on, on our app service, the PaaS offering, where you can you can do these log points on an app that's running on app service. Right. And the interesting thing there is that you can do, you can do uh, console log debugging, mm -hmm. which for, for better or worse, like that is what we, that's what we know, that's what we're used to. You can do that without breaking without pausing your application without hitting a breakpoint. So you can oh, get gotcha. that state information while the app is running in production without causing any sort of performance implications. That's the that's the big the big thing there. <laughs> that's amazing. I remember the, the the bad old days where it was oh something broke, right? So you're <laughs> okay. Um, do I have the right SSH keys to get into the server? Oh boy. Right? And then once you're in then it's okay. Oh this this log's only twenty gigs. So I'm going to grep through it, and hopefully, right, you know, or I'm going to, you know, use the tail command in Linux, and then I'm going to, you know, pipe that to a grep, and then I'm going to go click randomly in my app to see if I can reproduce it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is a all part of a, a a a larger plan to basically up the level of diagnostics experiences mm -hmm. for JavaScript developers overall. Yeah. So you know. JavaScript developers are used to using console log. Like, that's just where everybody kind of comes from, right? Yep. But stepping to a full debugger might be feel a little bit too foreign for some folks. Mm -hmm. um, and then even further, if you think about what happens in C Sharp or in C++, people use traces and dumps to actually yep. figure out kind of what's going on in their application, right? So yep. so what, we, what, we, what we're hoping to do here is to basically provide a on-ramp mm -hmm. so that you can get more used to the diagnostic features that are out there and kind of ease your way into more sophisticated, uh, you know, diagnostic tooling. Mm -hmm. So basically it starts with everybody writing out console logs. The next point is this log points thing where it's not really a debugger. Nothing happens in terms of pausing your state, but you can take a console log and put yeah. it in dynamically into your application so you can look at, at the output. And then the next step after that is is a debugging capability or one thing that we're, we're working on is time travel debugging where basically we can capture the execution of your program mm -hmm. and then you can go uh, look at the execution after it's happened and basically attach to it as though you were in a debug mode. But really it's just allowing you to debug against the... Um, what was captured previously. So basically the production state. Awesome. Some more yeah. of that next level stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, and I think the reason people, because we had visual debuggers forever, right? Yeah. But people reach for that console log because it's easy. Yeah. And if I can get the information I need in one or two steps in two minutes, that's what I'm going to do, even though I have the visual debugger that can tell me what the problem really is. You know, I just want to get it done, and I'm kind of lazy. So, you know, that's kind of my approach. And so, yeah, just having the next step up where it's, oh, okay, now this thing's running in production, and I can, you know, I can instrument my code in two minutes the same way. Right. And I can yeah. get really solid information back. I mean, that's really powerful. 
I think that I think that node developers too. I know it, in my case, it was a long time before, before we even had debuggers and breakpoints. Mm -hmm. Like we had the built-in node debugger where you could do node debug yeah. blah, and then you could step through with F and B and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, that was not so fantastic <laughs> and then we got node inspector which kind of got us a little bit closer we yeah. can debug our node apps in chrome but it it took a long time and i think i think what's happening is a, a lot of the node developers uh, adopted very early and they're used to javascript and node and console log because setting up a debugger like there's there's yeah there's time there's effort to set those things up and now we have VS Code. Now we have things yeah. where it, it there isn't setup. It's literally just hit F5. And for yep. most Node apps, it just it just works. Uh, that getting to that point, getting used to those things is it, it's it's starting to happen. But I think it's been so long that we didn't have those kind of experiences that right. we just we just don't know to leverage them yet. I mean that's that's my case. I'm still a console logger and I oh, yeah. <laughs> use VS Code all the time. So it well, takes too. some time. I'm totally that way. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and I tell VS Code to run my server, so it's just in the other window. So when it halts, you know, because yep. I put something in there to stop it or <laughs> post something to the console, yeah, yep. totally. So yeah, so so does the Azure? Is it the same plugin to support everything on Azure, including Cosmos or Cosmos DB and all the other stuff? That's yeah, up there? Or? yeah. So uh, I would also like some feedback on these things. So if anybody has has tried these things and and is finding missing features or anything like that, I would love to hear that. Uh, what we're trying to do is target specific services mm -hmm. that, that node developers will most likely take advantage of right. and kind of make those things work together really well mm -hmm. instead of just trying to expose every Azure service because there's, there's a lot of them. And yeah. uh, there may be like some migration paths. There may be some forks in that. Uh, for example, if you start on the paths, you may end up with containers on Kubernetes or something like that. So right. there are forks and there are different paths that you can take. But the important part is the the services that matter to node developers to get them uh, onboarded onto the service. And then, so the other part of that is uh, also working with the platform teams to make the node experience mm -hmm. great on the service itself. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered the question or not. Uh, it does and it doesn't. I mean, so anything that I'm going to want to do on Azure mm -hmm. that's currently available is going to be in that plugin. Yeah. But you don't support all of the features of Azure because that's a lot. Correct. And, yeah. You know, you're only so many people working on it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a, that's a good point. We we have a team of uh, I believe it's four developers right now that are mm -hmm. focused on building these extensions. So this is this is a real thing. This is a real right. effort within Microsoft. It's not just me and a couple of other people like hacking on things. Like these are mm -hmm. real things. And yeah, to to that point, we don't have the bandwidth to do every service, and it may be like not every service appeals to Node developers. Right. Uh, we. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a couple of other services that I'd love to get in place. Some of the cognitive services piece, pieces, oh, for yeah. example, the bot builder, the bot framework yeah. stuff would be a really good one to get in there. Uh, but we just don't have the bandwidth for that, and we, we're kind of we're kind of building on what we have right. as we as we progress. So start with the PaaS, mm -hmm. introduce containers, do serverless, yeah. database, of course, mm -hmm. need the database, those kind of things. Yeah, I want to push the serverless bu uh, button for a minute. And I know we've yes. talked about it. I think I talked about it with you in November. I've talked to Chris Dias and a few other people about this. But how is it that you can test your Azure functions in VS Code? I just... You mean like hit, hit a breakpoint? Yeah. I'm glad you asked that. How does that work? Yeah. <laughs> so the, the Azure Functions core tools, which is the, uh -huh. the function CLI, that has the entire functions runtime that runs on Azure, like in the cloud, uh -huh. built into the CLI. So the same... .NET Core based app that runs your that hosts your function app is in that tool in the CLI tool. So what yeah. we're doing with the uh, with the local experience is we're just setting up the functions hosts. We're telling mm -hmm. it to start. It exposes a debug port just like Node, uh, and it looks just like a Node process. So the VS Code debugger attaches to it as if it were Node. Uh, the JavaScript files are all loaded in. Everything is cool, and then it just works. Like there's a little bit of magic yeah. there. But it is the exact same runtime that your functions will run in on the yep. cloud. That's that's like the that's the thing I always press on because when you're testing these, we always we always push on like containers and right. reproducible artifacts. It's the same situation here with with Azure Functions. Like it is the same runtime. Everything is exactly what you'll get. Yeah, I've had a few people complain to me about. Um, I'll, I'll mention a competitor about Amazon Lambdas, mm -hmm. right? And they're like, I push it up, 
and then it kind of works. But I don't know which part of it is not working, right? And I've told a number of people, I'm like, look, I'm like, you can keep everything else in Amazon. So move your lambdas over to Azure Functions and then just use VS Code to debug them. And they're like, really? Well, how does that help? And I'm like, because you can walk through it. <laughs> you you can know, test their, their, their eyes get all wide. What, really? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, and you can use a real version of Node with it too. So, Yeah, uh, one of the demos I did yesterday, this is like the, the one that is uh, like the mind-blowing demo, which is fairly simple really, is mm -hmm. to do uh, a first-party Azure Function binding to a storage account that watches a blob storage container. Uh, so it's a container hosted in Azure right. and then running the function locally. Mm -hmm. So I can go from empty directory to local development of, of a function that's connected to a resource on Azure, open the file in the storage extension, edit it, save it, hit the breakpoint locally. That's like that round trip piece. Like those are the, those are the parts that are hard to test. Yeah. But being able to do that locally before you ever start deploying or start paying money, like that's the, that's the good stuff. Yep. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the hosting provider I use for devchat.tv. I also use it for my applications that manage the RSS feeds, scheduling, and sponsorships involved in delivering these shows. DigitalOcean is easy to use, has data centers all over the world, and provides terrific services including server hosting and object storage for delivering your web applications and assets quickly and easily. I use DigitalOcean because I love their interface, I get SSD storage for my servers, and their support replies quickly. So go check them out at digitalocean.com. Yeah, it's amazing. But yeah, for me, that debugging feature is just killer. <laughs> because, I, I mean, I've been there with that pain. And then I go look up the, the node documentation to update what I've got in Lambdas. And all the documentations for node 8 or node 10, not node 4, which is what they're running over there. So, you know, it's... It's kind of a big deal oh, for me because <laughs> I don't want to have to think that hard. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what other features are we talking about here for uh, VS Code and Azure that we haven't hit yet? Uh, so those are the big ones. Uh, we, I think next we're going to start to open up more of that event-driven event -driven programming model. Uh, event Grid is going to be a big mm -hmm. one. So being able to build custom topics and then... Uh, subscriptions that hook into your Azure Functions, right. that will open up a lot more of that of that event-driven approach. So uh, you create t custom topics for like your organization, even mm -hmm. like emails within your organization or anything like that, that can then trigger Azure Functions. Uh, and then you can just start hooking everything up to serverless yeah. functions. And Let's talk about event, event Grid for a second, though. Yeah, they talked like, about it in the keynote yesterday, and I didn't yeah, completely it's, see It's a what really it was. important important distinguished uh, it's a, a, an important distinguishing feature for Azure uh -huh. kind of over uh, AWS lambdas which which is basically that that generally serverless platforms are uh, polling driven mm -hmm. so they'll be looking for an event on a regular rate to see mm -hmm. if the event that that you want to happen will kick off, you know, that the function should be initiated based on the event happening, right? They, they do right? that by polling. I they always do that thought by that polling. it was because I, you know, I sent it a request one way or the other. They do it by polling. They basically poll for, did that state occur, uh -huh. right? Okay. And, and that was the way that our Azure functions worked as well. Um, but then along comes event grid, which basically doesn't okay. work via polling. Right. Um, it actually gets initiated based on an event. Well, I'm an impatient person. I don't want it to be polling. I want it to happen when I tell it to. Yeah. Well, I mean, that it can make the difference, but you know, from a few milliseconds perspective. Yeah. But I think actually the more important piece is uh, the the compute time that's required uh -huh. to run the function is cheaper. Right. So uh, because well, that makes sense because it's not asking. Do you exactly, have something for me? Do you right? have something for exactly, me? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So so I think you know, in terms of like how quickly it responds, it, they probably are going to be mostly parity in terms of how quickly each of mm -hmm. them responds. Uh, it, you know, it'll be if I don't know exactly what the what the gate is, but it should be pretty quick on both cases. But I think the bigger factor is if you have thousands of, of functions that are going to be deployed and you're going to be paying mm -hmm. for that compute cost, Event Grid is a much yeah. more efficient way to do it. Yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and then the event grid extension it plays into the same kind of thing as the as the functions extension, which is that local local testing and development. 
So one of the core features there will be uh, the ability to mock out, like create a mock request uh -huh. to a, a topic. And you can even, of course, like the, the big thing is the custom topics. So you can create a mock request for a custom topic and then post that to a uh, subscription and then taste, test everything end to end. There is, um, there's a bit of limitation. I don't know if this has been announced yet. I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about this stuff or whatever, but uh, so there's, there's a bit of a limitation in that because- I won't tell your boss. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of a limitation in, in that uh, trying to get those those mock messages to post to local hosts. So uh -huh. you can have a locally running Azure function, subscribe to uh, a custom topic that uh -huh. is, is defined on your machine. That that part didn't quite work right. But as of, uh, I think it actually deployed on Friday, uh, there, are, there are dynamic events that you mm -hmm. can then point anywhere. So you could point them to your machine. You can start to do that local loop back. Right and get everything running. I haven't gotten that working yet. Uh, trying to get the demos ready for build, I didn't have time to get that, because of course it wasn't deployed until last week, but uh, that's that's gonna be the next the next thing that we're really, we're really pushing on. That's awesome. So if I understand the event get grid right, it sounds a little bit like queuing systems that we've used in the past to get work done, right? Then you hand it off to a worker, which is essentially your Azure function. Could be something else but something that's subscribed to it that picks right. up those events and then does whatever it's supposed to do. Right. Yeah, uh, functions, I think web jobs fall into that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I do think that there are analogies in terms of client-side web programming <laughs> that, that are yeah. accurate. Um, I haven't yet worked out in my head exactly what the analogy would be, uh, yeah. but but I'm sure that there is a good good one there that we should think about. Yeah, same. Uh, I've, also, I've also been, I need to talk to some of the devs that are working on the event grid pieces uh, because I overheard a, a bit of a conversation about event hub and leveraging event hub along mm -hmm. with event grid to build some like totally event driven like next level architecture and I have no idea what he had in mind but I want to sit down and, and have that conversation at some point yeah. this week while we're here I'm sure there's some interesting stuff you can do yeah there's some and, mad science well and since node is so highly event driven I mean you can you can probably do some interesting things there and just kind of have it work out whatever pieces you want alongside the event hub and event grid. Yep. Sure. So I'm, I'm also curious, what does the day-to-day -day look like for people working on VS Code or VS Code extensions? Mm. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> as, a, as a PM, my day-to-day -day is mostly focused on trying to interact with customers as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, now that we have some extensions that we've shipped, trying to get feedback on those things, uh, let people use them, trying to do some usability studies. And uh, the other thing is just trying to understand the decisions that people are making, the processes that they're choosing right. for deploying their node apps and uh, finding the pain points in those processes and trying to help them uh, get over those things. Uh, it's tricky. It's tricky. It's very tricky to interview people in a way that you're you're asking like, hey, do you need this feature? Without actually saying, hey, do you need this feature? Because right. nobody says no when you ask <laughs> if they need a feature. So you have to kind of like, tease it out of there. Yeah. Do you want a candy bar? Why, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> exactly. Never mind I'm trying to lose weight, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, I, like I said, there's, a, there's four devs working on this. So uh, a lot of a lot of uh, thinking about the vision, like the, uh -huh. the end goal of where we're heading and uh, customers and vision, that's that's my day to day. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we definitely take a, uh, we try to take a customer driven uh -huh. approach to our product development, meaning that basically we start by talking to customers who are either using our products today or who we'd like to use our products tomorrow and understand what their current pain points are with their current tool set. And then basically from our perspective, it's it's finding those opportunities to address their pain points. That's really the, the best way for us to develop product. So uh, in terms of the way that our team works, a lot of time is spent basically interviewing customers, either customers of our products today or or people who we aspire to use our products, um, and then figuring out what their pain points are, and then from there, exploring what kinds of concepts and solutions, like the specific you know features we should be doing, uh, could be, and then we kind of progress to testing that, 
And then once that happens, once we've gotten to the point where the the testing has been validated and the customers say, yep, that's that looks good, that's when we start to engage with the engineering team and start to get it built. Um, and then from there, it's really the engineering team's responsibility to kind of make sure that it it meets the uh, meets the customer's requests <laughs> and requirements. That's awesome. Well, thank the entire team for us. Yeah. <laughs> For the internet, I guess. <laughs> right? <laughs> Everyone who listens to the show. Because, I mean, you know, I, I hear from people and, you know, they, they hear about VS Code and then they hear about the new features. Oh, I got to go try that. And, you know, step by step, you know, things are getting easier. And that's always nice. So. Cool. Cool. I, I don't know if I have any other questions um, other than just. Do uh... you want to talk about Cosmos DB a little bit? Sure, what would you like yeah. to know about Cosmos like, DB? There are a lot of people who probably don't know what Cosmos DB is. Like, well, it would help if you'd quit changing the name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Microsoft. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's a good point. We, yeah. We're still catching up on that one, on the extension yeah. from, from the yeah. DB days. Uh, so let's talk about Cosmos DB. So from the perspective of a Node developer, there are... So Cosmos DB is, is a database engine that is globally scaled. It has... To be honest with you, I don't fully understand all of the features of Cosmos DB. I know it is very large, mm -hmm. and I know that it, it can scale in ways that I, so, I can't so, imagine yeah, ever needing. So it's like a globally <laughs> distributed database where you can have, it's a, a distributed uh, distributed database. Uh -huh. So what that means is that you could have a, a collaborative database that, that different regions are working on right. that that all eventually sync to a master, uh -huh. um, but it's entirely distributed. So, yeah. like, let's say you wanted to have, uh, you have data, and, and there's some reason that you have optimization for local data. Mm -hmm. So let's say you, you have mapping information, for example, right. and you want that to be updated in real time, but you want that data to be hyper available locally uh -huh. yep. within the region and you want it to eventually sync with the global master right but it's not as necessary for it to be globally synced mm -hmm. as it is to be locally synced quickly yeah. and so it's really optimized for that kind of a scenario where like let's say i want to i have a mapping feature and i want to be able to pin a map on something mm -hmm. right and then i want to share that pin hyper locally yep. so basically i have because Azure has the most globally distributed data centers of any of the public clouds, uh -huh. um, you can basically, let's say you're in South America or you're right. in specifically, you know, Chile or something mm -hmm. like that. You can basically have that, that super high availability of the database of the data that is being posted and read right. specific to that region. Yeah, I think Satya said something about having the master, multi-master thing worked out yeah. in the keynote yesterday. Right. And I was thinking to myself of the nightmares that I had setting up multi-master like PostgreSQL and stuff. Right. And it's like, oh, you'll do that for me? <laughs> right. And the Super cool nice. thing about it is the way that, you know, a JavaScript developer would would interact with it is it just looks like any NoSQL database. Yeah. So, right. so there's really not a lot of like learning that you mm -hmm. have to do to kind of get this to work for you. It's really just that you want these these features of a database, you want these characteristics of a yep. database, but your interaction with it is just like MongoDB. Right. Yeah, that's the thing that I thought was impressive about it too, is that let's say that you have your own Cassandra cluster that you've set up to do more or less what you're talking about, right? Um, which is also a pain, I've also done that. Um, you know, you could switch seamlessly over to Cosmos DB because it supports Cassandra API. It right. supports, there, there were like six or seven different Open source, uh, yeah, uh, database protocols. To, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. That, that's where I was looking for protocols. Yeah, and so yeah, so it's like, oh, okay. Well, I'm I'm not going to bother setting any of this up, right? I'll just pay Microsoft to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so we've been very focused on the the Mongo API that's on top of Cosmos uh -huh. DB. That seems to be uh, what we're all super familiar with the NoSQL Mongo experience. Uh, Mongoose works really well with this. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what we it's. It's more first class than the extension, honestly. So the scrapbooking works with the Mongo pieces, yeah. but not necessarily with the SQL API. So we're, we're getting there for that. But again, targeting the Node experience, the JavaScript experience, so favoring the yeah. technologies that we tend to use. Yeah, which Mongo is kind of at the top of the list. So. Yeah, yeah. 
Very nice. Well, I'm going to push you guys uh, for some picks. Now, you've done this before. Yeah. Oh, boy. I won't um, tell Matt what's about to come. <laughs> <laughs> so what we do for picks is we just shout out about things that we like, things that we're enjoying. Um, it could be, but doesn't have to be tech-related. I'm probably going to pick some TV shows and stuff. So anyway, Amanda, do you have some things you want to shout out about for us? Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Um, lately, I've been having a lot of fun talking with my dad, who's a theoretical physicist, about quantum computing. Oh. And we have, a, <laughs> we have a quantum extension for VS Code and for Visual Studio that oh, allows wow. people to program with qubits. And so we've been talking about, you know, how algorithms will change and, uh -huh. and stuff like that, which is kind of a cool thing to think about. And it, we had a great conversation this weekend that got us into talking about the value of blockchain and like, um, and, and our, each of our perspectives on where we think the blockchain trend is heading. Interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting. I, I don't know that now I can I want have to a conversation. Talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> my dad's kind of a genius. <laughs> He's really cool. Reminds yeah. me of my grandpa. Yeah. No, my dad, my dad, you know, he was a theoretical physicist at Los Alamos for uh, 40 years. And then he retired. And now he works for a chip company uh -huh. in Silicon Valley designing, using um, uh, his background in theoretical physics to design chips. Oh, wow. So he's, yeah, kind of an inspiration. Yeah, the last thing that my grandpa invented on his own was an ellipsometer. What's that? So an ellipsometer is a laser-based tool that measures the depth of the uh, oxygen layer on a silicon chip. Oh, cool. Wow. Very and, cool. And... Um, the one that he invented would sit on his desk. The ones that they were in using at these uh, these big manufacturing places to check their their silicon for quality were basically as big as the room we're sitting in, and they could only check one or two out of every batch of silicon. And his was fast enough to check them all. Wow, <laughs> so, that's cool. I don't know if he ever sold it to anybody, but yeah, that's cool. It's it's funny just the parallels there. I just thought that yeah. Was yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know. In my family, it's like every generation just does whatever is the science of that generation. Mm -hmm. So like my grandfather, my dad's dad, uh, was a mechanical engineer and designed the air ball bearing, uh -huh. which is basically a lot of the machinery that's behind the modern jet engine. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, my mom was super bummed I didn't get a PhD. And I think our family line is going downhill because my grandpa had a PhD <laughs> in uh, some kind of engineering. My mom's a math teacher and I'm a podcaster, so go figure, right? <laughs> uh, oh, boy. But awesome. you're more famous. I don't know about that. No? I don't know. <laughs> uh, anything else you wanted to shout out about? No, I don't think so. I don't All right, think Matt, do you have some things you want to shout out about? So I, I think I was supposed to be thinking about that while, while you were doing yours. But it could I, be anything. You I don't have really to. just focus on what you were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the things that I've been into lately, uh, I've, been, I've been learning a lot. So I've, I'm fairly new to Microsoft. I've been here for about a year and a half, and I've been spending a lot of time just learning as much as I possibly can. The things we were talking about with customer development, that has been like what I do when I go home and my daughter's in bed is I start reading through these books about customer development and marketing of all things. I never thought I would be reading about marketing uh, <laughs> to, to try and get better tactics to get in touch with customers, which is right. way harder than it sounds. It seems like it should be easy, but it's really hard. Uh, so I, learning is my <laughs> customer development learning. And uh, that, that's all I can come up with. I, do you have you some know, favorite I, books or anything? Yeah. Uh, books that I'm reading right now. So or videos or what, however you're picking it up. 
Uh, so there's there are a couple of books that we have internally. The uh, Customer Driven Playbook is one that, that I've been reading a lot. We have a, a customer interviewing event coming up on Thursday. So I've been cramming on that book pretty hardcore. Uh, aside from that, I've been reading uh, The Speed of Truth, which is a really interesting book. It's mm. one of the Covey books. Uh, that's been an eye-opener personally for some of my yep. my own internal struggles. Uh, what else? I have, I have this giant reading list, but I can't come up with anything on the spot. Yes And is another book that I've been reading. Uh, for marketing stuff, it's mostly just been like digital marketing for dummies kind mm-hmm. of things. you got to start somewhere. <laughs> yep. Were you going to chime in with something, Amanda? No, I was, I was curious about the speed of truth. What's that about? Uh, it's basically about how to... Uh, so when it comes to truth and trust, there is uh, it's essentially... How do I say this? There's, there's a common thing with, with truth. So if someone trusts you, things move quicker and they cost less. Sure. So uh, mm-hmm. I've got to come up with a good example here. Uh, there's just not as much friction to get well, something. Yeah, I mean, even like in your everyday interactions, if, if we trust each other, we can have a conversation and you trust that things are going to happen the way that, that I say, et cetera. Whereas if you don't trust me, there's that, that trust isn't there. There's a tax. Yeah. Because I have to convince you that things are going the way that right. I say. Uh, so it costs more money. It takes more time. And so a lot of the book is uh, mostly about these these principles around like what trust really is. And then the first part of the book is trusting yourself, like building up your own credibility internally and holding yourself uh, accountable to your values, like defining your values and, and keeping yourself uh, very much aligned with your values. So that's that's where I'm at right now. That sounds like a great book. Yeah. I got to pick that up. It, it's one of those Covey books, man. They're yeah, all good. I haven't read it. <laughs> all of them. I went to a pool party at Stephen Covey's house once, so I'm a genius at all this stuff now. <laughs> I would, I would love to hang out with him. It sounds. Oh, uh, he passed away a number of years ago, but yeah. yeah. But he was, he was an interesting guy. Of course, mm-hmm. I only met him one time, but yeah, interesting, interesting stuff. So I'm going to jump in with stuff that's a little less geeky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've been just kind of kicking back and you know watching some shows and stuff. Um, I, I've been going through some personal stuff that I'm not going to talk about on the podcast, but um, anyway, so I, I've been watching a whole bunch of stuff on like uh, Amazon Prime originals and things like that. Nice. Um, one of the shows on Amazon Prime, it was a BBC show. It's called Orphan Black. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard about that one. And uh, anyway, it's it's really, really interesting. I don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen it. You figure <laughs> out what's the, the main premise within the first few episodes. But you're going to spend the first two episodes kind of going, what is going on? <laughs> okay. i got to check it out. It's so. pretty fantastic. And the actor, like, the, the main actor is really, really good. Yeah, she's really good. Yeah, the just all the different parts that she plays and then going, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, now I know. That? You guys, that was a spoiler. All the I, different parts think, she plays. I don't yeah. think that... I, I don't know. Like that, that will be in the premise of the show. I don't okay. think yeah. that's much of a spoiler. All right. Uh, experiencing so. it is much better than, yes. than hearing it. So anyway, I'm going to pick that. Um, like I said, it's a BBC show, so the first season's like 10 episodes. Um, so I've kind of been binge-watching that. And uh, yeah, I also just want to shout out about Visual Studio Code. Um, one of the things that has really been helpful for me is that you've opened up the extensions to everybody else. And so I've been able to go out and, you know, I've pulled in tools for, you know, Ruby linting and JavaScript linting and all of the different parts of the apps that I'm building. And it just comes together really nicely and I haven't had any conflicts between extensions or anything like that and I think a lot of that is due to the way that the extensions are architected and so just a huge shout out to the team because yeah I'm it's funny because before it was like yeah I've tried it but now I'm loving it so yeah I mean and I think we are learning a lot from how VS Code is architected and bringing some of those learnings back to Visual Studio as well to make it more robust so um, there's a lot to be learned around the way that the language service is architected, mm-hmm. the debugger service is architected, yep. that makes the core of VS Code really reliable um, while still allowing the extensibility surface area to be really rich. Yeah, I think the other thing that it shows us too is that there's really no limit to what you can do with Electron. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, you're doing some pretty awesome stuff in <laughs> Electron. So. Yep. Yep, yeah, sure. and specifically shout out to the team in Zurich. Uh-huh. Like, uh, they're working really, really hard to make VS Code run really, really well in Electron. And in Redmond. About half of the team is, is in Zurich and half the team is in Redmond. Yep. Yeah, the Zurich team to... doesn't get enough credit, though. <laughs> I talk to the Redmond they, people they all the time. Get, they, they both 
don't get enough credit. They yeah. should both get credit. I think our initial episode about VS Code was Eric Gamma and nice. Chris Dias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we kind of got the best of both. But yeah. <laughs> That's a awesome. solid duo. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to high five to Zurich, but I high five the Redmond people on a regular basis. I think you can do like a, a Giphy or something. <laughs> there we go. There you go. <laughs> so can we, talk, can we go back? So what, what are you reading right now, Amanda? What am I reading? What do I, so what do I want to read? Um, I, I do want to get deeper into AI because we just did mm. this, uh, this IntelliCode stuff. And so uh, there's a lot for me to learn around, around machine learning and deep learning and getting just deeply in there. Um, so that's kind of the next on my tech list. Um, for my personal list, reading a lot of children's books. Mm, nice. <laughs> Every night. <laughs> Probably five times in a row. <laughs> and you get uh, there's a there's a handful of really good ones like Ada Twist Scientist. Oh yeah, we got those. My son's four and a half, so we got all of the all of the Ada Twist Scientists and the <laughs> the Izzy Peck Architect one. and yeah. and uh, Rosie Revere Engineer. Yeah. All of those are just fantastic books. My uh, my what? daughter can't quite say Rosie Revere, so it's Rosie Beer. Oh, cute. <laughs> Rosie which, Beer Engineer. Um, which age groups are those for? Like my four year old loves okay. it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, mine's three. She's real into it. Yeah, <laughs> my kids are 12, 11, 9, 7, and 2. Wow. You There's got a span. A... So, so, yeah, so they're probably a little bit juvenile for them. But, but the two-year-old would love it. Yeah. I mean, we started reading Izzy Peck Architect to our mm -hmm. Iggy Peck Architect. I said Izzy because my son's name is Izzy. Um, we started reading that to him when he was like two. It's great. Great yeah. book. A lot you know, of fun to read as a parent. I'll check it out. Yeah. I, have a, I have a friend that did a, a Kickstarter I don't know if it's okay to plug this or not. Go but, ahead. Uh, it's, it's actually just really good. A friend that did a Kickstarter, uh, it's called Carrot Pants Press. And they mm -hmm. have this book called Ed Gets His Power Back. And it's all about like this LED named Ed that lives on Brent Bordeaux. And it kind of builds up these electronics fundamentals. And oh, cool. uh, you can build these circuits along with it. That may be a little better for that age group. Mm -hmm. I have the I had the book and my daughter is not so into it. It's basically just like a book That's about cool. a weird looking dude named Ed. But uh, maybe as she gets older, <laughs> you can start yeah. building the circuits. I actually I have an electrical engineering background, so I have a bunch of these things lying around, and uh -huh. I cannot wait until she's ready to like be interested in these things or not be interested in these things. Yeah. That's cool too. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, there's another there's well. another book Thanks. that uh, that that we read to my kid that's also about tech, which is called Tech. It's T E K. Yeah, that's the name of the book, and it's basically about this cave kid. He's a child, but he's a caveman, and he's addicted to his device. <laughs> 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 and so it's about how he wants to stay in his cave and and only interact with his device. And then finally, there's a volcano or something, and the and the power goes out, and so he can't play with his device. And he has he's forced to go outside. That's and so relatable. It's it's a great <laughs> book. It's a great book. With my son, he you know he doesn't get device time unless we're on an airplane or at a restaurant. But uh, but but he also never wants to go outside either because a it's Seattle and it's rainy, <laughs> and b he just got into Legos, so oh, yeah. he just wants to be in Lego heaven all the time. Yeah, my both of my boys went through a therapy program where they told them they could do Legos or origami and stuff. Oh really? And, yeah. So wow. my oldest just graduated from that. He's twelve, and yeah, that's all he wants to do now. Nice. Yeah, we just started the Lego thing, the Lego and the Play-Doh thing. Yeah. yeah. That is like, yeah. yeah. Uh, it used to be we had we had an iPad that she could play with every now and then. Uh, now she doesn't care about it. It's all about the yeah. Lego. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. The, the things that I've been reading to my kids these days, there are... So my third grader and my fifth grader, they have Battle of the Books. Mm. And I don't know if they do that at all the schools. Is that like scholastic reading kind of thing? Um, I don't I mean, know who the group the is that puts out the list. <laughs> But they put out a list of books, and then they basically answer questions about the books for their battle. Mm. And they do it at the middle of the school year. That's and cool. And so I just, I've been getting those books on my Kindle and just reading them to them. Cool. Nice. And so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. I'm, I'm really digging the tech books, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, last thing, um, if people want to find you online, where are you? I am at, at Amanda K. Silver. Uh-huh. Twitter. So... I am five is prime, all spelled out, all over the internet. Okay. I think I've got it in most places. So, yeah. And do either of you blog or anything like that, or is it mostly when I, Yeah, when I blog, I blog on either the VS Code blog or on the Visual Studio blog. I, I don't blog, actually. <laughs> I, I'm real bad about my internet presence. I, uh, I tend to just tweet about when I'm at places yeah. trying to meet people. Uh, I, do, I try to do a little bit more like direct interaction mm -hmm. with people. 
and not so good at the blogging thing. Unfortunately, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> I just I'd recommend to make the sure people blog. could find your thoughts if they <laughs> yeah. wanted them. So, all right, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you cool. both for coming and talking to me. Yeah, thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a 